Welcome to the Story Talks Back. Almost everything that we remember, think about, or imagine is a story. Stories entertain us, inform us, and even define us. They have upsides, and they have downsides. This podcast explores the power of story in every aspect of our lives. I'm Dave Stanton. Thank you for joining us. The author of a dozen books, Timothy Ferris has been called the best science writer of his generation by the Washington Post. His bestsellers, The Whole Shebang and Coming of Age in the Milky Way, have been translated into 15 languages and were named by the New York Times as among the leading books of the 20th century. A former editor of Rolling Stone magazine, Ferris has published over 200 articles and essays in The New Yorker, Time, Newsweek, Forbes, Harper's, Scientific American, Vanity Fair, and other periodicals. His three PBS documentary films, The Creation of the Universe, Life Beyond Earth, and Seeing in the Dark, have been seen by over 20 million viewers. Ferris produced the Voyager phonograph record, an artifact of human civilization containing music and sounds of Earth launched aboard the twin Voyager interstellar spacecraft. Now exiting the solar system, the Voyagers are the most distant probes ever created by humans. Ferris has received the American Institute of Physics Prize and a Guggenheim Fellowship. His works have been nominated for the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. He is currently an emeritus professor at the University of California, Berkeley. Okay, Timothy Ferris, it's great to welcome you to the Story Talks Back. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me today. Thanks, Steve. Good to be here. Um, I want to start out, uh, as I usually start these interviews, by asking you about stories and storytelling in your past. So uh, can you think of or uh, do you remember any storytellers in your family or in your immediate circle who were really important to you and um, how they may have influenced you? I do. Um, my, my parents were storytellers, both of them. Uh, my father was one of five brothers out of Belfast, Ireland, and they're all storytellers. An article I wrote that ends with uh, an account of um, going to visit one of my uncles in the hospital in New Jersey and then driving back to his house uh, where his wife was preparing dinner with the other brothers. And they were telling stories that were so funny that we were staying in the car rather than stop the storytelling. And she saw us out there and opened the front door and yelled out to us with this big booming voice. She said, um, don't keep the good stories out there. Bring the good stories in here. <laughs> um, and so I, that side of the family are all storytellers. My father was a professional writer. My mother was also a writer, um, wrote literary essays, things like that. Um, and she had been an orphan, so was, was more, somewhat more disconnected from the storytellers in her family. But uh, her father, was a, a, a circuit preacher, um, Western Pennsylvania and up into Ohio. And uh, sometimes when I was be giving scientific talks, I would feel that I, I was sort of like him. I was uh, a uh, preaching except on behalf of science and facts and reason rather than uh, religious belief, but with a, a similar, I, I would say humanist uh, uh, basis. And my parents had a number of friends who were uh, uh, fiction writers, novelists, and such. So as a kid growing up, I was able to garner some good advice from them. I remember asking one of them, uh, a um, mystery story writer named Le Leslie Charters, who was quite popular back in the day, a number of his books made into movies. I asked him if he had any advice, uh, if should I if I happened to turn into a professional writer and he said, yeah, get an office like everybody else 
get an office, get up in the morning, go to work. Don't hang around the house all the time. And I did that for 20 years. It was good advice. Um, and then their milieu, uh, the, the parties I would see from a distance growing up, uh, was, was that of um, not exactly what get called intellectuals these days. A great deal of nonsense gets written by intellectuals, but by thinking people um, uh, who are creative, um, uh, songs, writer, the composers of songs like Irving Berlin uh, and comedians. Um, uh, uh, meeting professional comedians as a boy was a big influence on me because it taught me just how high the standards are. Um, trying to tr try to get a laugh from a professional comedian. I did as a teenager. And the closest I got was, was I once told Jack Parr, who had The Tonight Show in those days, I told him something funny, not a joke, but an observation. And I got a thin smile, just a little thin smile. And he said, that's funny. That's actually, I'm very proud of that. That's about a, that's a lot to get from any professional. Uh, so I, I regard it as a compliment. I, I didn't go around trying to burden these people with my teenage wit, but, um, but I learned that a, a bit about just how high professional standards are in, in uh, creative, creative work. Uh, these were not people of, uh, great advantage in the world. Irving Berlin started as a singing waiter on the Lower East Side. Um, but they demonstrated what hard work and good sense can, can bring about. And you know, a story I, I didn't know back then, but I since learned from reading biographies of Irving Berlin, is that he in, got engaged with a young woman who was from a wealthy New York family. And her father was, uh, I guess, shorthand, we would just say an anti-Semite, and to, uh, told his daughter that if she married Irving Berlin, he would disinherit her. This is a family, a big place on Fifth Avenue, an enormous mansion on Long Island. This was not a, an idle threat. And Irving Berlin, troubled by this, stayed up the night before their wedding and wrote a song. I forget which one. I think it was I'll Be Loving You. That And he gave her that song on their wedding day. That one song earned four times her total inheritance. And I just think that's a story about the nature of creativity. Not exactly storytelling, perhaps, but, uh, but how, uh, uh, what, a, what a, an open field for competition a talent has in a, in a free society. Was there anything about those stories that your parents and your relatives told that that taught you things about storytelling what makes a good story yeah um one of the things i learned about storytelling is do not waste people's time um i've given about a thousand lectures in various places and uh, if you've got 600 people in the audience and you waste one minute of their time that's hours of uh, human time that you've just thrown away. Uh, you just don't, just don't do it. Be prepared. Uh, be be respectful of other people's time. Um, and uh, and be honest. The I mean the the, the reason I think one reason that uh, funny storytelling, comic writers like P. G. O'Rourke or any any long list of Fiction, funny fiction writers you can make and, and all these stand-up comedians we have today more in the U.S. than anywhere else have a lot to do with the huge wave of immigration in the U.S. and the fact that so many of these folks were living in um, what were called slums which is to say very low rent jammed together kind of housing you go on the streets of the Lower East Side circa 1905 let's say you'd see all kinds of people jammed together and, and and you were constantly a witness to both the things that were different from you and your background, but also had some common ground. And part of what was common about was, was funny. You had these jokes about back then, banana peel jokes. They survived into cartoons into about the 50s. Now, I've never come close to seeing anyone slip and fall on a banana peel, 
But on uh, Lower East Side of Manhattan, let's say, or the, the lowest areas of, of uh, Chicago, these other big immigration cities, sort of early 20th century, you actually did see stuff like that. And if you were lucky, you would see someone who was a little better dressed than everybody else, kind of thought he was something special, <laughs> slip and fall and it'd make everybody laugh. It didn't mean they had anything against him exactly, but it, it reinstated that sense of reality that uh, all of our pretensions are kind of the same. Early on in your career, you were one of the original writers and editors at Rolling Stone. And yes. you were writing about Sly and the Family Stone and, you know, some incredible creative people, but also people who were rock stars and in this incredible machinery. I mean, what did, what did that whole experience teach you about the power of storytelling and, and what makes a good story? Yeah, it's hard to say in a musical context, except economy, which is the great uh, lesson of uh, popular songwriting. Um, if you ask, uh, oh, say Mark Knopfler is a real gentleman, creative person, or Bob Dylan, or uh, uh, Johnny Mitchell, uh, the songwriters of that period and on through till today, uh, they'll certainly affirm that uh, the, the good, let's call it a rock song lyric, but it could be anything, a good pop song the same way. The first, first principle is, is economy. You're not wasting any words. Uh, now, in some songs that devolves down to repeating the same phrase over and over again. I'm not sure that fits into the, uh, the lesson. But uh, the the economy of uh, of good lyrics and poetry too. I mean, Wallace Stevens, good example, uh, is is something everybody has to learn from. It's really the same principle again. You can't waste the time of your readers. You, you, if you've got to get to the core of what it is you have to offer, if you don't have anything to offer, then you, you efficiency won't work for you, and that's how you get vast outpourings of uh, nonsense that we have, for instance, in uh, postmodernist writing which is millions and millions of words about nothing at all, really. Uh, I always liked music, and I learned later on that music and astronomy in particular have a long history together, and that's certainly been the case with me. Uh, um, and it does teach some of those uh, lessons, the need to be kind of honest about what you're you're doing. I mean, kind of in the sense that you're, you're being imaginative sometimes in songwriting. You're imagining yourself as someone other, particularly when you're starting out. You don't have you know that much sense of yourself, maybe. Um, so it, it's it, it, you, you you can be you can imagine things that ring true, and uh, if you're good enough, that will that'll work out. But I, I was also writing about science at Rolling Stones. One of the things I liked about being there was we were experimental. And we did not have this dead hand of having supposed experts on the staff in what our audience did or didn't like. Uh, so we could find out for ourselves. I wrote a full page piece on cosmology in Rolling Stone. And we had no idea what the audience was for such a thing. And then I heard a few weeks later that Bill Wyman, the bass player for the Rolling Stones, was having a party at his place in the south of France and he had stood up at the party and made everybody be quiet. This was like 40 or 50 people and read them that entire article from beginning to end. And I, when, I, when I heard that, I thought, you know, maybe there's an audience for this. It's, it might be, might be impossible to actually make a living writing about this, which is certainly the stuff that most interested uh, me. I could add that scientists, um, the best of them in my impre impression, my experience, have also been uh, uh, pretty well rooted in storytelling. That is, if you were to ask a, an astronomer like Alan Sandage or a physicist like Stephen Hawking um, about a particular scientific finding, often the response would be a story about who discovered what, when, and what they published, and how this other paper then corrected one error, and then it and those are stories. Uh, so I, I think the storytelling goes pretty deep in human mind, even in, um, in, the, the, in science and, and mathematics. I mean, how did you, you, you started to dip into scientific 
storytelling or writing with Rolling Stone. How did you sort of become full-time focused on that? Uh, I think it was because uh, it was what I most wanted to write about. When I had learned, it was at Rolling Stone that I learned how to write long form nonfiction, pieces of 5,000, 10,000 words. But once you can write something at that length, you can write a chapter of a book. You're only one step to go to being able to write a book. And organizing those chapters into a book conceptually and executing it and, and doing what's required day after day for years of, of labor. My first book took seven years of writing is, um, is very difficult, but it, but it can be done. And once you learn how to do it, then you're in the position of being able to, to write books, uh, uh, going forward. And, and I've never, I, in my opinion, there isn't any better occupation. I don't mean that it's the best of all occupations, but, but writing a book is not a stepping stone to somewhere else. Um, and around me at, at Rolling Stone and thereafter, there were uh, young writers who'd gotten up to the threshold of being able to write books who were signing contracts to write books that they themselves would not have read. That is, that you'd be offered a lot of money to write, say, a biography of David Bowie. David Bowie was a great guy. I was happy to to meet him, have as little to do with him as I did, you know, the little bit that I did have to do with him. Um, quite like David's work. But writing a biography of David Bowie is not a high, or anyone else, is, uh, is not a high aspiration necessarily for a young writer. And I was concerned that if I took some, some rewarding job to write a book that could be done in 18 months and would sell a lot, you know, and so I'd make some money, that I could see stretching before me a career in which you were doing things like that, which are fine, but they're not original. You, you're not creating anything new, really. Uh, and... I don't mean that that's not a perfectly good career for a writer to have, but it's not the career I was after. I, I always wanted to create something that hadn't been done before. Um, for me, that's the the test really of creativity. It's a, you got to take it as far as you can. So I, I I knew that science could be relied upon. That if it took me a long time to do this lonely work, that still I could. Um, I, I would never be let down by the subject. So my, my first book was just, you know, it's a horrible experience in many ways. And I was sort of thank, promised the Lord in whom I didn't believe that if I could just do this, I would never try such a thing again because it's so, so difficult. Uh, but that difficulty is inherent in, in, uh, in real creative work. It had nothing to do with the subject. Subject is tough, certainly. You know, I had no scientific background. I had to learn all this science and math and stuff. But, uh, but it's mainly the the discipline of, of of creating enough order out of your own head to be able to do something useful and and worthwhile. And uh, I, I wanted to, to 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 have a subject that would not be limiting, and, and that proved to be the case. And how did you, or how do you? maintain that momentum, that sense of structure, that, you know, that storytelling pace, you know, so that you can get through book after book as you have done. Well, it, it, each, I think each time it's different, you know, um, I think all creative people in all the arts have stories about how they, you know, did something that was a fragment and got set aside, and then years later you combine it with something else, and you don't really understand exactly why it's it works the way it does, or why it doesn't work. I, I wrote a book called The Whole Shebang, which was a technical challenge in that it was not particularly story or oriented. It was there was not a narrative line running through it. I compared it to climbing an ice wall that you you have no there are no trails at all, and that proved to be very difficult. So difficult that I I wrote drafts for thirteen months before I got a single sentence I could keep. And I remember that sentence. I was sitting in this room. I'm at my observatory today, up in Sonoma, up at Sonoma Mountain, and I was sitting at this desk, 
when finally I wrote this one sentence and looked at it, 13 months, every day I'd come in, read what I wrote the day before and say, yeah, okay, it reads like a professional writer wrote it, but it's boring. It's not going to go anywhere. I would never ask anybody to read this. I would try rewriting it. I would try just writing on ahead and paying no attention to how bad it was. It's not a bad technique, by the way. You don't want to, you don't want drafts to be too good because there are always lots of things wrong with them and why polish something that you're going to have to throw away. And then there was this one sentence and I looked at the one sentence and said, oh yeah, okay. That, if I can write like that, that, that could make it work. And um, so that was a hundred thousand words of drafts thrown away. Um, but then the book didn't work. <laughs> Who knows why? I mean, I guess, you know, there may be a temptation to think that nonfiction book writing or article writing is somehow less organic or less um, spontaneous um, than, say, writing fiction, you know, a novel. Mm -hmm. But from what you just described, I mean, that's like a novelist story, you know, that it, they wrote the first chapter 300 times before they yeah. finally got it. Yeah, I mean, poets, some poets write drafts and go back and revise everything. A, a few of them, like T.S. Eliot, insist on getting every every line correct before going to the next line but then Eliot was wildly rewritten by uh editor you know pound famously edited the wasteland so so it's it's um i don't know because i don't write fiction whether you know um i had an argument with norman mailer about this as to uh, what the uh the differences but then the, the, that night norman came over and apologized to me said his hearing aid wasn't working properly and he hadn't understood my point correctly so so that argument didn't really take place either um i don't know it's uh, he but he of course had written both first rate fiction and nonfiction. um it's just hard to say any genuinely creative work as far as i can tell is is awfully uh, difficult and the the people who do a lot of it uh are kind enough to conceal that fact they're not always complaining about it it's, after all it's their chosen profession but psychologically um it's a real high wire act and you know writing books i don't know what songwriting is like particularly but uh although my son's a songwriter but um uh, Writing books, you know, you're swinging from vine to vine in a in a rainforest in the dawn mist, and you just have to you let go of each vine, hoping you're going to see the next one. Um, you have no idea what will happen if if you don't. I mean, you talked about uh, you, you sort of anticipated a question I wanted to ask you, which was, you know, are all the great scientists and the great scientific theorems really rooted in storytelling you know it, can you can you have a great theorem that isn't a isn't a good story well yeah quite possibly i mean it, particularly at the early stages if you're doing if you're a pioneer in quantum computing or quantum physics or mathematics um it, it's it's hard to compose much of a story at the time, in retrospect, you know, you can, it, it's, it, it's often said that, for instance, um, I used to read that the ancient Greeks could have had science and to put us all 2,000 years ahead of where we are technologically. If only, for instance, when they were boiling water and the lid of the pot would start to bang up and down from the boiling underneath, if only they had thought, gee, we could make a steam engine out of this, you know. Uh, but that's not true. That's a false point. Um, because science, it doesn't work like that. Sci science is not a matter of having the right idea. Science requires having the right technology. The Greeks were nowhere near having the technology necessary to construct machines that would answer basic questions that you would pose by constructing machines to do experiments. The Western European tradition got the idea that science is a matter of deep thinkers thinking up deep ideas because that was their own tradition. Western intellectualism was all based on the analysis 
of the works of the Greeks and Romans, specifically and principally Aristotle. When the first uh, scientists began showing up at universities, people like Newton, um, or when political writers like John, uh, scholars like John Locke, who was basing his work on science, went to university, they were deeply disappointed to find that the universities were locked up in Aristotelian dogma, that they weren't interested in learning anything new at all. A lot of our universities are like that today. Um, there, there are whole departments more involved in dogma than in learning. Uh, so it, it uh, retrospectively, you can tell stories about the rise of science at 10 that are often false, and most of the books about the origins of science are false in that regard. Science is something that happened once technology reached a certain point, not the other way around. And that's a hard story for intellectuals to tell because they don't know anything about it. They're not engineers. They, they don't know how a steam engine works. They don't know how electricity developed or why it works. They think electrons flow through wires and such. Um, and consequently, we, we're in a highly technological scientific society in which only a tiny minority of the citizens understand science and technology. Um, we tend to blame the schools for that, but it's hard for people to learn things that haven't been around for centuries. And science is only about three or 400 years old. I mean, you, you approach science, or you did, as an outsider. Um, yeah. And probably even though you've learned so much, you still are not... I don't know if you consider yourself a scientist. Uh, oh, no, no, no. It would be, uh, I, I couldn't make a reliable parallax make a measurement on a nearby star or any of that stuff. So do you, do you think that has helped you in your, in your ability to talk about science and, and turn it into really compelling stories? Oh, I don't know that it helps. I mean, uh, if I'd had a scientific education, as there's some good science writers who did, you know, and they do well, so... No, I don't think it's, it helps or hinders it. It's the, the path you're trying to find is so narrow and twisty and it's through so much un, unscouted territory, no matter what kind of creative artist you are, that, um, uh, you know, it's, um, I, I think it's largely mysterious. I mean, if you ask Yuja Wang, you know, how she got to play the piano that well, I, I don't know that she could could tell you she and her teacher tell each other stories you know maybe she might be a good interview in that regard but um no i i um the, the scientists who've written good popular science stuff have also been good storytellers you know carl sagan could tell a story quite well and um so it's i do think that maybe it's useful for non-scientists to write popular science, uh, as as the many do, um, be, because it exemplifies, insofar as it exemplifies that uh, uh, science is is part of our is culture, it's fundamental to our our culture, and the scientific storytelling is an important part of our our culture, and 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 more interesting in the long run, and certainly more informative than say Grimm's fairy tales or. Uh, biblical stories about people with putatively uh, superior moral values. Do you feel that, um, I mean, one of the, one of the aspects of storytelling is the hero, obviously, and um, frequently it seems that in science, there isn't just one hero. There's a, a succession of people building on each other's ideas and, you know, it takes the whole sequence of, of, you know, observation and experimentation to actually come up with something. But, but really sort of like our, our notions of storytelling is we want that hero, you know, we want that, uh, that one person like Edison, you know, who, who uh, solved everything. Do you think that that's, uh, that makes it hard to tell a really authentic, true story? Well, there's, there are a lot of moving parts in that question. Um, you do have heroes. Uh, Edison's an interesting choice because, of course, Edison employed a lot of people, and uh, and there's a the the romantics, particularly in the their current guise as so-called progressives, 
the romantic movement always having been anti-science and uh, anti-technology um have have for the last few years been engaged in a quixotic campaign to make a hero out of uh, Nikola Tesla, who worked for Edison for a while and whom Edison supported for decades after Tesla went completely uh, psychotic. Uh, and to portray Edison as a kind of a capitalist who exploited the his workers who had all the the real ideas. Uh, so the the hero myth cuts both ways. The most successful man in the United States today, Elon Musk, is suffering from exactly the same kind of reaction. If millions of Americans think they hate Elon Musk. They don't have the slightest idea who he is or what he does. They've just been told that they're supposed to hate him because he made a lot of money. And the fact that he kept risking his money, all of it, again and again, um, doesn't seem to gain any any credence in this in this narrative. And it's true that their their work does involve lots of other people. But if you have, you know, I've been in this situation, if you have 300 brilliant people in a room and one of them is Stephen Hawking, the person you probably want to hear from is Stephen, not the assistant professor of uh, geology who may be terrific too, but not quite that, that bright. There's always a considerable verticality. You know, there, there are only a few, few uh, composers who write like... Uh, Bach and Beethoven, and uh, that's just a, a fact. There are only a limited number of geniuses. So science is not the work of just a few geniuses, certainly, but we would be way behind if we didn't have the, that list of geniuses whose names were carved in marble over the doors of the old uh, science buildings and college campuses. And do you think that... Um... I mean, there's there in your book, uh, Seeing in the Dark, um, you talk, talk, talk about all the wonderful amateur, quote unquote, amateur astronomers who are really advancing our knowledge in, in big ways. I mean, do you think that that line between that's maybe blurring between professionals and amateurs in science is a, a rich vein for storytelling? Yes, I mean, the, line, the, the lines have always been blurred. They just some, sometimes appear clearer than they are. If you have an academic appointment, you know, that, that suggests a certain kind of expertise. But you could be a, someone like Thomas Edison, who's uh, getting brilliant results uh, as a, just someone running a company. Um, and there, I don't see any necessary need to draw... Um, lines of demarcation. I've always myself loved stargazing. I was here last night, late at night, uh, photographing things far away. Been doing that since age 12. And I have no idea why. Um, I have the uh, the same the same stereo music thing that's been evolving since when I was 16 years old. Um, I have no idea why that's been so important to me either, but, but, but we, it's not necessary to know, you know, it's, it's just, uh, one can live a rewarding life. You don't, uh, you don't have to examine every element of it. We all got taught, taught Socrates, and we were taught that Socrates said an unexamined life is not worth living, which is a foolish statement. Unfortunately, uh, Socrates never said it. So <laughs> you can, you can live an unexamined life if you like, and not, not necessarily anything wrong with that. And one of the lessons of science is that you you don't win by arriving at a final explanation for why you're doing stuff, because there is no final explanation. That's a myth. I mean, you've mentioned Hawking a couple of times, and I know you spent a good deal of time with him. Um, is there anything about the way that he's been mythologized uh, in retrospect that kind of teaches you about the way people want to view science or how they want to relate to science? Well, I think that for many, many people do want to have a hero of some sort, or they want their kids to have a hero that they can point to. Um, and maybe for some, it might be you know, a military general, or for others, it's a scientist or a poet or something like that. Um, I don't know if there's anything wrong with that. Uh, 
uh, being turned into a kind of a hero because of his disability uh, was certainly a day-to-day -day irritation for Stephen. I, one of the things that used to drive me crazy, and I think probably him as well, was that he, because he, he couldn't speak, uh, people would start raising their voices when they talked to him as if he couldn't hear. I don't know what, what it was, but I, I would see professional physicists lean over. We'd be at dinner. I was sitting next to Stephen, and the people would lean in. This was at Berkeley. And he said, now you know, Stephen, we back at the department have been working. <laughs> 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 that stuff cracked him up. But it also made it possible for Stephen to write a best-selling book. Um, because as I told his publisher, just put his photo on the cover and you'll be you'll be okay. It was a big advance. It was very expensive to be Stephen. And despite myths about um, you know government uh, health care in England, um, he 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 could not support himself and 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 the people he needed to move around to, just to get a make a, a plane flight somewhere without more money than was what he was going to get from the government or anybody else. So he wrote the book to solve that problem and it did and it was always important that it be his book even though it's quite difficult for Stephen to write a book like that because he did not have the ability to do what the rest of us do which is to say oh here's an interesting story let me go look up a couple of books and check my facts on this story he could could not do that his publisher got cold feet and asked if I would co-author it with Stephen and um I wrote to him and said that I, I don't think that you should do this and uh, you should, I don't think you should have a co-author of any kind. Um, and even though it's difficult, everyone will, you know, people will come through and many of his colleagues and, and I as well did help in editing the manuscript to, to deal with those immediate shortcomings. So being a hero uh, um, worked both ways for, for Stephen. It meant that it was to some degree irritating and people were always coming up and feeling sorry for him which, which he didn't much like uh, but it, um, it it also gave him uh, financial support that uh, helped a lot another project that you were central to that i i think is just sort of endlessly cool is the voyager uh album which you essentially yes. produced and yes it's the sort of I don't know what it's actually made of. The the, the record the is um, the record is uh, aluminum. Uh, no, uh, the record is copper. The case it's in is aluminum, and it's gold coated uh, for the same reason a lot of spacecraft parts are coated in gold so that you it's electrically neutral so it won't generate fields that are, interact with other components on the spacecraft. But we were able to get those specs in early enough so that the thing could fly because uh, all components they all have to be checked against one another uh, so yeah, it's had... called the gold record because it was coated gold but uh, from what i understand i mean your task with that record was to basically tell the story of what it means to be human or to live on earth through sound is that yeah. is that what you tried to do I think that's a pretty fair description of it. I mean, less portentously, I, I, my view was always just that we're going to, once I decided to go to half speed on the record, we had 90 minute slot for music. And so my position from the beginning was, well, let's just make a good record of 90 minutes of great music from Earth. Um, because if, if we fail at that, we've really failed. How could you fail to make a good record? given those parameters there's you know you could make a voyager record every year for a, for a century and they'd all be great records if you're drawing from the entire corpus of human music uh, so to avoid um my feeling was let's just let's just make it a good record and let's make it not parochial let's try to have lots of different kinds of, of music from around the world not just the culture that launched built and launched the spacecraft um, that the results didn't satisfy the hard left, but nothing ever does. So that, that didn't bother me. Um, uh, the, um, I think, I think we did a credible job. 
but I don't think that was so hard to, to do, as I say. It, it's uh, it, most of our concerns with were with how the pieces might interrelate interrelate uh, to an intelligence that might not have any oral overlap with us at all. Their sense of the passage of time might be very different. And there are all sorts of reasons why music, our music, might not work for them. Uh, so I tried to build in mathematical relations, things like that, that would help. And then there's also a, a sound effects portrait of the history of the Earth, which is, I think, kind of a cool thing. Andrew and did the primary work on that, and uh, um, it's. Uh, uh, I, I think that piece stands up quite nicely as a sort of a historical bit of uh, sound engineering. I mean, did you have the sense that it had to have some kind of narrative arc or some kind of uh, no. sense? Or you just you just felt that the the actual sounds needed to work together? Oh well, do you mean the the natural sounds? Yes, or the or the or the music. It, uh, it, yeah, it's it's a logarithmic history of the Earth. So it begins with a molten planet, and uh, in logarithmic, because obviously it would be the human civilization would go by a fraction of a second <laughs> at the end, otherwise. And you're hearing technology and human sounds and all. And it's it's it's. I think that was an interesting uh, use of the uh, of the format. The Voyager record, the data on the Voyager record will last at least a billion years, more likely more than two billion years. The Earth is only four and a half billion years old. So that's a very long time. A billion years is four orbits of the galaxy for the Voyager record. And there is no other technology that would uh, that can make that, that can warrant that. There are no, there are no optical chips or digital recordings or anything that will do that. So, so it was a terrific coincidence uh, in technology. If I were doing it today, if I were making a Voyager record today, I'd make it exactly the same technology. Fortunately, it's still available and it's popular. More, more records were sold in Europe last year than CDs, uh, but, uh, but it's obviously a fading technology. Just in terms of storytelling, I mean, we have talked about a couple of your projects. Is there one particular project that stands out as having been a particular challenge or particular <laughs> satisfaction in getting it right? <clears throat> no, I, I think we were we were fortunate with the Voyager record because it could have gone wrong so many ways. And um, that was really Carl Sagan's uh, experience with NASA and his um, his realization that the right way to do this was with a small group of creative people and not to get a, a bureaucracy involved. Fortunately, we didn't have enough time to get a bureaucracy involved anyway. But uh, as has been written about in the various histories of the project, uh, the closest we came was some pressure to put a song called Moscow Nights on the record because it would appease the Soviets, if you can imagine such a goal, that allegedly the Soviets would like the record these these mass murderers would like the record if it had this horrible song on it. So we listened to the song once and said, no, it's not going on, just like we did hundreds of other songs. And that was the extent of it. But had had this been decided five years in advance and a NASA committee been assigned and everything, it, I think it would have been more difficult to to, to create something uh, distinctive and and, uh, and lasting. Uh, and my rule has always been if I'm involved in a project that that gets so starts going off sideways in terms of its creative potential as I just get out of it because those things can't come back. When I was making films, doc, documentary films, I would occasionally get asked to help with with shows that were having trouble. And you know, they someone would call and I'd say, "All right, well, um, who's in charge?" Who's the person, the one person who stands up and says, I take responsibility for every moment of this film when, when it's done? They say, well, there's so-and-so and there's so-and-so and there's this other person. So in other words, nobody. There's no one person who refuses to point to someone else if there's a problem. And who's your on-camera person? No, it's so-and-so. And how do you all like that person? Well, we don't like, don't like him much. 
um, and how much have you shot? You know, well, we've shot a hundred days and now we're looking how to edit. And I said, well, it's, it's too late. You know, it's, it's too late. It's the creative work has to be the work ultimately of one person. I know a symphony has many people and everything, but it could be all kinds of elements, but one person has to say, I stand by this. I'm talking to you. And if it's wrong, it's my fault. I will never, I will never say that somebody else was there. I was interviewing a couple of directors once for a documentary film and everything they showed me, they had an excuse. This, we ran out of money. This other thing, we were at high altitude. This other place it was, it was windy. And, and I finally said, well, if I, if, you, if I were to let you work on my film, would you be available to apologize for it all through the screenings? Or um, Because that's, you can't delegate that, you know? Uh, so, uh, so, so the, the Voyager was was difficult in the sense that it could have gone wrong. All we all we needed was to have the wrong person in charge. But uh, but Frank Drake knew what he was doing, and Carl Sagan knew what he was doing, and uh, the rest of us uh, were able to uh, to get some uh, some good because I think a good result. Uh, um, I mean, maybe that is uh, we you know. We, we benefited from having not not enough time and not enough money, which always helps. You know, it's it's a lot a lot of the best movies ever made were made with too little time and too little money, and some of the right. worst ones had too much of both. So it's a, it's a lot of creativity in general. I think works that way. Yeah, I think so. there's a certain kind of leanness that uh, you need. The the um, I mean the, that you could say that that's the subject of most of Cormac McCarthy's writing. Is the uh, the essential ingredients to creativity. So, is there any other thoughts on storytelling or stories? I mean, I feel like I could ask you a bunch more questions, but I know uh, I want to let you get on with your day. So, uh... oh well, um, no, it's been a pleasure. It's such a fascinating subject, um, and I, you know, there's always a there's always a, an amount, a certain amount of risk in creativity. Humans and human institutions try to proof themselves against originality. Um, many, many cases, and fortunately, the the creativity has has managed to break loose in in our world. Uh, historically, only for a relatively short period of time, but its power has been so great that um, the odds are it'll. It'll, it'll be able to continue. Uh, but it's it's not that long ago that uh, virtually all of the world was ruled by non-creative people and institutions uh, who made creativity very difficult. They would, uh, they would throw you in prison for it. They would kill you for it. They would ostracize you. They would threaten your family. And the majority of the world is still like that, but it's a narrow majority. Much of the world is free and open to uh, creativity, to start to telling new stories, to having new ideas. People will pay to listen to someone talk and make them laugh for an hour, uh, undermining everything they came in with, because if they already came in thinking everything that they were about to hear, they wouldn't be laughing. Uh, that spirit is, uh, is uh, very encouraging, I think, about the, the future of our species. Well, thank you so much, Tim. I really appreciate your time and, and your insights. It was uh, great talking to you again. Nice talking to you. Be well. Bye-bye. The Story Talks Back is produced and hosted by Dave Stanton. The music you're hearing now was written and performed by Christopher Daydream. The theme music at the beginning of our show is an excerpt from Play by Merlin Twelfthoven performed by Kronos Quartet as part of their 50 for the Future series. Please subscribe to the Story Talks Back on Podbean and check us out on Instagram. See you next time.